talk, and I decided rather than having a fancy introduction, uh, which introductions are always very strange to me. It's like they're going to tell you, I don't know, what you're about to hear, but ultimately you're judged on what you say. So it doesn't matter what the introduction says anyway. So I'll just give you my own introduction. My name is Jeffrey Tucker. We've been, uh, we've been doing this uh, session, and I've, I've, I've worked for uh, Brownstone Institute, which is something like the beachhead for, for all terrible news you don't want to hear. So if you want to stay happy, um, you don't want to come to this lecture. Uh, the last night, I was supposed to give a lecture on how to develop your own domestic bar, which I didn't give because we ran out of time or something like that. But it occurs to me that that would be a much more valuable lecture than what I'm about to tell you today. <laughs> uh, very valuable in the sense it might help you survive it. However, I think over three years, we're not really at the place where we, we understand that it's important to deal with reality, right? Do we all agree that dealing with reality is, is important? We're not willing to just keep our head in the sand anymore. It's, it's fine to be um, in the sand or in the clouds, obsessing about very, the finer points of libertarian theory, uh, but I'm not sure what that amounts to when civilization itself is sweeping to destruction. So. <clears throat> I don't know why I expected it to be a little quieter over here, but uh, maybe that's just the nature of Porkfest, that you're competing with people just 10 feet away from you. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, so let's just start with the, um, with the terrible truth. Uh, we no longer have a civilian government in this country. The idea of the United States, the idea, was that we would elect people to represent us, and those people would go to Washington or to the State House and represent our interests, and if we didn't like what they did, we would vote them out of office. And we would get new ones. And if you read the works of, I don't know, Thomas Paine or, um, you know, any of the framers of the Constitution, they believed very strongly in this idea of citizen control of government through democratic competi competition. You want the government in the hands of the people. Um, now, there are problems with this theory, but I must admit to you that I have a romantic attachment to it and I'm not going to let it go. Maybe I would rather have a world in which we have no government at all, but if we're going to have one, it would be wonderful if the citizens had some influence and control over it. That would be the ideal situation. Uh, um, unfortunately, gradually over the course of, say, half a century, if not a century and a half, we can argue about when do you want to date this. There's a new apparatus that's taking control of, of the daily operations of the government. It's called the administrative state. We talked about this at some length. Uh, I think it was last year, right? We talked at some length about the administrative state. What I did not know last year, which I know this year, is the extent to which that machinery has really seized complete control away from any semblance of representative democracy to the point that in this country today, um, it's mostly an illusion. It's just a, the way the real managers of this country treat it is, is like a sideshow. It's just a circus to keep you distracted. It's pretty interesting to me because when I was growing up, there was this thing called the Soviet Union that nobody remembers. And I used to marvel about the fact that they had decrepit old men who pretended to be the head of state. And, and that, th that people would every few years go to the polls and vote for them. And thinking, that system is self-evidently fraudulent. It can't possibly last. And yet here we are, 
with a decrepit old man in charge of our government. And we're going every few years to, to go to the polls. And we imagine that that gives us control over the government. I'm telling you, I'm here to tell you it's not. And you don't need to know any more that <coughs> the next election is going to be between and drop off and Chernyanko, I'm sorry, uh, um, Trump and Biden. Just like it was last time, maybe, unless something really happens. And I do think something can happen, but I tell you, my friends, we've got to work really fast if we're going to get this country back from what happened to us. Um, the date of the coup d'etat in this country the final coup d'etat against civilian government. Our nice friends are remarkable. They're now only, they're, they're doing 15 feet of so social distancing and still talking just as loudly. So, anyway, it's, sorry, it's just a little bit of distraction for a speaker. Hold on. Uh, my friends, yeah, it's just a little bit, yeah, I mean, God bless you. You know, we're all so, we're all so excited to be together, right? <laughs> After, after, you know, years of everybody telling us to socially distance, you know, we feel like rebels just hanging out and talking, you know. Um, anyway, the date was March 13th, 2020, and, and it was silent. We didn't really know about it at the time, although there are clues all around us. They were everywhere. Um, so I want to reconstruct this history for you as best I understand it to give you a sense. Um, it's true that, s that I feel, I'm filling in a lot of gaps here because there's only certain things we know. Certain things we know for sure, some of, the, some of which we have to fill in. And I'm, I'm, I've actually lost patience for the difference between what I'm filling in and what I can verify. One of the big problems is that what happened to us was entirely secret. So it's held behind um, uh, confidential and... and, and uh, secure documents and that sort of thing. This is why they were going so crazy when Trump had a bunch of uh, classified documents at his house. It's like that's the worst thing you can ever do is retain classified documents. Because if you have classified documents, it's very possible you just blow the whistle on the whole thing, right? So, so they, have to, they have to put him in jail for his great... It's like keeping everything classified is the most important thing. I have a lot of my friends are doing FOIA requests these days, and the documents come back with like one sentence and three pages of blackouts, you know? So we really do have a secret government, and it's not, uh, it's not pretending anything to be anything other than that these days. Okay, so let's, let's just go back, actually, to, to January 2020. Uh, and, and think back to the middle of the month when there was a lot of reporting about a virus in China. Now, for a lot of people in Washington, this was very exciting. Uh, because, because they had this president in office whom they hated. And they, they first they tried to get him out by claiming that he was elected by Russia. That turned out to be a complete bunch of baloney. And then they claimed that he made a, you know, a bad phone call to Ukraine, and they impeached him for that, and that didn't work. Finally, flipping through the card, card file of panics and ways to manipulate, manipulate the population, they stumbled upon infectious disease. And so they amplified the fact that there was a virus circulating in China in January. Now it turns out, we know for a fact that this virus, which we called SARS-CoV-2, had been circulating in the United States since September 2019. It, how many of you knew that, actually? Yeah, it had been around a very long time when we were going about our lives, you know, doing liberty stuff and, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, paying no attention to this whatsoever. Now some people question that, that that's not true. You know, why, how come then did we have a wave of death in, uh, in, in the middle and late, of, late March and early April of 2020 if the virus had been here since September? Now, there's a couple of answers to that. Uh, one might be the sort of scientific answer that says a virus takes its time to travel around. You know, it doesn't, you know if, I'm, if I'm sick as a dog, then I give it to Lou, then he gives it to this person. It depends on the transmission rate. It could take... We might have to camp out, camp out here for months before everybody got the same disease, depending on, the, uh, on the, the rate of infection, depending on the fatality rate, right? Like if I gave it to Lou and he kicked the bucket, then he's not going to spread it. On the other hand, if it's mild, then he'll spread it to everybody eventually. 
So maybe the timing was just right. On the other hand, maybe the mass hysteria of March, the closing down of the hospitals, the screaming of the media, the freaking out of the government, the, the fact that everybody started running around with their hair on fire, panicked a population that was already vulnerable and led people to just die of their own, just, you know, and also not to mention, uh, deliberate infection of people in nursing homes, and then uh, if you went to, the, went to the hospital, they were afraid you had COVID, so they would shove a ventilator down your throat to make sure you didn't breathe out. You knew this, right? That's the reason for the ventilators. The reason for the ventilators was not to cure you. The reason for the ventilators was to keep you from breathing so you wouldn't spread COVID. And it turns out it worked. Most everybody who ever went on a ventilator is dead. It was basically mass murder. Thank you, Trump administration. So it's very possible that you can account for all the excess deaths between March and April by the panic alone. That is a terrifying reality. If you think about the implications of that, uh, you know, it's a scandal for the ages. It's very possible that that's what happened. I can't swear about it, but it seems true. Anyway, middle of January, um, uh, China communicated with the U.S. That, a, that they've discovered a virus in, in and around the Wuhan lab. The U.S. had long been funding uh, lab work, bioweapons research mostly, in the Wuhan lab. The reason they did it in Wuhan was because it was basically frowned upon in the U.S. We had been outsourcing it through third parties. In this case, it was through a, 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 a nonprofit called Eco Health, Health Alliance. Uh, the guy who heads the Eco Health Alliance wrote an op-ed for the New York Times on uh, February 28th, the same day that the New York Times famously said, uh, to take on the coronavirus, we should go medieval on it. Okay, so all these things came together. I mean, the, the conspiracy is out, out in the open, my friends. Anyway, Anthony Fauci and some of his friends, including um, Jeremy Farrar in the UK, started getting worried because they knew for sure that the Wuhan lab was funded in part by the National Institutes of Health to do gain of function research. And they thought maybe it could have been a lab leak, either accidental or maybe deliberate. They didn't know which, but they're pretty sure it was a lab leak. And that's when the damage control began because they figured it was going to start World War III. A bioweapon from China, could be the end of, of the world, but actually much more importantly, their careers. So that's when they started plotting together on the phone. They started going to burner phones. This is not speculation. This is all admitted by Jeremy Farrar. Um, they thought that they were, their own lives were in danger. They didn't sleep. You know, they went on secure phone calls. By February 4th, they had the answer. They had a document proving that it was not a lab leak, but rather was natural in, uh, in, in origin. The entire paper was a fake. It was a fraud. It was assigned by Fauci. They drummed up some fake science. They distributed it. This paper was published 30 days later in, in a, the, the journal called Nature. So just the beginning of the fake science that began to dominate our lives in 2020. Um, this was early February. Now, Fauci uh, was pretty sure, and he started reassuring the press, including the Washington Post and others, that we can handle this virus. It's going to be maybe a severe flu, but otherwise we'll get through it. But they started worrying because a lot of people didn't believe this paper. That's when the panic began. There's a window in which we don't entirely know what happened, but between February 4th, 2020, and about February 25th, 26th, um, the entire security apparatus of the you know, US government started to panic. They started to worry, and they decided to take control of the pandemic response, which they did. And they informed Fauci that this was happening. The national security state, the intelligence agencies would take control. Uh, it was also during this period that a national security employee named Matthew Pottinger 
uh, started calling his friends around Washington to tell them that a terrible bioweapon had been unleashed from China. Now, who were his friends in, China, in uh, Washington? He had a lot of friends in Washington. They were all on the right side of the political spectrum because he was a well-known China hawk. You know what that means? Like he, warning against the evils of the China. China's evil, CCP is terrible, we, we have to do every, whatever we can. Interestingly about Pottinger, he's fluent in Mandarin, as is his wife, who is herself a virologist. He called Tucker Carlson, among many other people, and said, listen, this is classified information. I work for the National Security Council. I have the highest levels of security clearances. I'm telling you, something terrible is on the way. Now put yourself in that, in that position of getting that phone call. You're in possession of really powerful, ridiculously extraordinary information. And he follows up by saying, Xi Jinping figured out how to do with this virus. He locked down Wuhan, locked it down. Nobody can spread it to anybody else. That's how, we're, that's how he, and he successfully dealt with it. This is the way we in the United States have to do with this. Trump needs to get on board with this. So now you have a whole series of people in Washington, I'm gonna estimate a dozen or so, who believe this to be true. All of them Trump partisans. And they surrounded Trump, including Tucker Carlson and his wife himself, who took a trip down to Mar-a-Lago and, and, and took Trump aside and said, I don't know what they're telling you in Washington, Mr. President. You know, people keep things away from you, but this information is too explosive. You have to know about it. Um, there's a bioweapon coming from China. The only solution is that you have to lock down. Now, Trump is a little bit suspicious, right? I mean, he's got good instincts on these things, and he's like, yeah, I'm not so sure. So he continues throughout most of the, uh, of the month of February and even early March, March, tweeting out that this is not going to be bad, we're going to be able to handle it, everything's going to be fine. By March 8th is when things started getting really hopped up. The mayor of Austin, Texas, out of nowhere, cancels the most important arts festival in the United States, Arts and Music and Technology Festival in the United States, is called South by Southwest. And out of nowhere, he canceled it. This was March 8th. Your tickets, burn them. Your hotel reservations, forget them. Don't come here. Your flights, forget it. International flights, out of the question. The, cancer, the whole conference is canceled. This thing was going to hold something like 250,000 people. And the mayor, who's a nobody, and nobody's ever heard of this guy, has canceled the most important technology festival in the United States for one of the most important cities in America, and he did it on his own initiative. Boom, done. Now, I think that that was uh, in response to this national security state, which at this point had geared up to the highest levels. On March 9th, Trump tweeted out, this is just the flu, everybody just relax. That's when Fauci, Farrar, Pottinger, <coughs> the rest of the crew said it's time. We have to tell the president. We have to tell the president what's going on. So they took him aside and they said to him, Mr. President, we have some very bad news for you. I know that nobody wants to tell you this is because it's classified. This is probably a lab leak out of a US funded lab in Wuhan. They might have made a virus designed to kill you and kill lots of Americans in response to your trade war. This is part of your war with China. And the way you fight back is to do what the great Xi Jinping did, which is to lock down the city. Now, uh, and he did it, you can do it too. You're at least as great as he is. But we've got an even better deal for you. For about 20 years, we've been working on this technology called mRNA. It's a platform technology. It allows us to create a vaccine very, very quickly. We've already sequenced the virus back in January. We're gonna have this vaccine out by the summer. And then it'll be just like in the movies. You'll lock down the country, stop the virus from spreading, then we'll 
manufacture hundreds of thousands of the antidote, stick every American in the, in the arm, we'll avoid this, this evil virus, then you, Mr. President, will sweep into re-election in November. Yeah? And he is surrounded by everybody important. Meanwhile, Pottinger uh, has appointed a very in interesting person to head the coronavirus task force. Her name was Deborah Burks, also known as the Scarf Lady. Okay. Everybody demonizes Fauci, and rightly so. She was the real actor here. She was the really important person. This is on March 9th. <coughs> so everything's coming to a head. Trump's a little bit caught in this whirlwind of information and panic. On March 10th, he tweets out, we're going to have a whole of society, whole of government response to the coronavirus, which is the exact words that the national security state recommended that he use. That was all the prattle around Washington, whole of society, whole of government, meaning that everybody must comply. Trump went along with it. Now, um, I've been pretty tough on Trump for doing this, you know, for a long time. But as I'm explaining this, maybe you can see the way they created a bubble around him, you know, a, a kind of a secrecy, terror, fear, bioweapons, solution. And he's got 12 of the world's most important powerful people around him screaming at him to do this. So he, he went along. This was March 10th. March 12th, he shut down travel from Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, the whole of Europe. Shut it down completely. Let's see, he had already given in on the China question already back in January. He shut down tra travel from China. But now he's going after American families, uh, uh, loved ones. Americans were, tr I think the kibbies were stuck in Europe and they couldn't get back in time. And he gave everybody three days to get back. Over the weekend, they mapped out the protocols for what Americans are going to do. And the answer was, lockdown. And the sentence read, all public and private venues where people congregate should be closed. All public and private venues where people congregate should be closed. Your homes, your churches, your civic clubs, your concerts, your bands, everything. In other words, there's no Bill of Rights. It's all gone. Now, you could say the president didn't have the power to do this, and that's true, legally. But when there's a coup d'etat, nobody cares about what's legal and what's not. So Trump was the instrument of this coup d'etat. He didn't know it, but he was. I think he figured it out eventually, but he's not admitting error. But he was the tool, and he was the ideal tool because Republicans didn't question it at all. They went along. If a Democrat had done this, they would have been all screaming, this is the end of, the, of American liberty, the end of, end of American freedom. But because it was Trump, they trusted him. And Trump said sometimes in those days, he said things like, you know, the media's actually been really kind to me recently, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. I don't know why. Everybody seems to like me so much. You know, get a clue, Trump, get a clue. It's because you're doing everything the deep state wants you to do. So he didn't resist. <coughs> that was March 16th. What else can I tell you about these days? Ah, let's roll back three days. March 13th. This was the release of a confidential document marked classified uh, by the Health and Human Services Department of the United States in which they mapped out the coronavirus response. This document was released six weeks later by the New York Times. Why? I don't know. I read it many times. I couldn't really understand what it said. It took one of my own researchers, Debbie Lehrman, to explain what it was, and her explanation is actually ridiculously simple. She drew attention to an org chart about who was in charge of the coronavirus response. Guess who was at the top of that response? The National Security Council. Our good, friendly security agencies. They were the rule makers. Operations, CDC, NIH. 
In other words, it's fun to hate on the CDC and Fauci and NIH and so on. I'm telling you, my friends, they were not in charge. They were there to carry the water for the national security state. That's the truth. So that is the date of the American coup d'etat, March 13th, a Friday, 2020. It was all over at that point, all over. The Constitution didn't matter. Elected representative, representative government didn't matter. Nothing mattered. Your rights didn't matter. It was the end, the end of everything. And we hardly knew it. So I'm sorry for you know, the, 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 the deliverer of bad news, but that's, that is the, the truth of the situation. Now you might say, has it ended? Uh, sadly, it has not. You know, it didn't go away. Nobody ever repealed that order. And if you think about it, Trump never issued another order to repeal his March 16th edict. How many of you watched that March 16th pr press conference when that sentence was read? Have you watched that online? I've been trying to get it out there. Yeah. So it's a, an amazing moment because a reporter asked Trump, wait, are you saying that all, I don't know, like bars and restaurants in America have to close? And he seemed a little confused by the question, and he deferred it to Fauci. Fauci looks at Deborah Birx. So what had happened was that these sentences had been written over the weekend, um, and they had gone through all the official press conferences and everything for the, on March 16th, and nobody had read them out loud. Now, they had passed them out to the press, but they put them on page two in teeny tiny print that you could barely read, so none of the press ever read anything uh, uh, that was there. And so Ber Burks and Fauci both knew that these lockdown orders were there and had been issued, and that they knew for sure the next day that the CDC and the NIH was going to broadcast them out to all public health offices around the country. They knew all this was going to happen, but nobody had breathed a word of it yet because this is the sentence that they needed to sneak in. And so uh, Trump is confused by the question because he himself didn't know, am I closing all bars and restaurants? Am I closing? So, he, so he, uh, he looks to Fauci. Fauci looks to Burks. Burks gets up to the microphone, but she loses um, her nerve at the last second, right? She can't do it. Because they're afraid that if they read the sentence out loud, there's going to be like riots in the street and a revolution. This is a very dangerous moment. So she gets up and she begins, begins to dissemble. She's like, well, you know, we've looked at the question of whether it spreads on surfaces or not, um, which has nothing to do with the question at all, right? She goes, and you've seen the data. So she's clearly bullshitting. Fauci uh, figures this out. She's lost her nerve and, and starts to motion to her. And, and she says, oh, um, my, my, my boss, so, so, you, you see what's happening here, right? Somebody has to read the sentence. Nobody wanted to do it. So she, she's like lost her nerve. So she's really thrilled to see that. And Fauci's frustrated with her. She, he's like, God damn bitch. <laughs> Why is it always me? Why am I always the guy? All right, fuck it. So he gets her attention. She goes, oh, oh. Well, Anthony wants to talk to you now. You know, he's, he's, my, he's my mentor, and I, I always let him speak. So she's, she's like this nervous prattle, like she's a 17-year-old girl. He wants to speak, so I, I always defer to him. Uh, Anthony? So he comes up, and he says, look, it's in real small print on that PDF, real small print. Uh, you, just, you have to read it. All indoor and outdoor venues where people uh, congregate should be closed. The order of the CDC. And he walks away from the podium. During the reading of this sentence, Trump is standing like right here, and somebody in the audience gets his attention. So he's not paying attention. He's like, what? Oh, yeah. Hey. I see you over there. Good to see you. Yeah. The microphone falls silent. So he didn't hear a word that Fauci said. The microphone falls silent, and he goes, Oh, I guess it's my time to talk again. Walks over there and says, yeah, is there any other questions? Not one reporter in that, in that room asked 
a basic question. Something like, uh, Mr. President, have you given the most totalitarian order in edict in the history of government? Something that Stalin, Mao, and uh, Hitler would never have dared to do lest they be overthrown. Have, has this actually happened? And I'm not sure why that didn't happen. Probably because people were just genuinely confused. It was too weird a moment. It was, like, it was surreal, you know? So the next question was something else, I don't know what. And then they closed out the press conference. And that was it. That's how the coup occurred. It took 70 seconds. The coup occurred three days earlier and it was announced publicly on March 16th over, th over the course of 70 seconds. And that was it, that was the end. Okay, that gets us to March 16th. Trump's still hoping for the vaccine, right? It doesn't come, it doesn't come. Then we get the BLM riots in the summer. So already, you know, you've got every school in the country closed. You've got every church shut down. Uh, you know, pe people, are, we've got drones flying the skies. We've got mass panic. Everybody's freaking out. People are dying left and right out of panic. Maybe not the virus, but out of panic for sure. We've got people being vented to death. <clears throat> and then you've got this, uh, this drug that was being pumped out by uh, the FDA called Remdesivir, which is also known as Run Death is Near. And that killed, you know, countless thousands of people. It, it, it proved to be utterly worthless and, and actually, uh, yeah, basically a death sentence approved by the FDA. Hey, do you remember those times uh, when, I was, when I was younger, when I was just a naive libertarian, I used to think that the problem with the FDA is that they weren't approving enough drugs. Did, were you ever with me on that? I used to think, yeah, right? Remember that? I remember thinking, ah, oh, it's bastards, you know, the bureaucracy, and not approving enough drugs. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you another funny story. Just hopping forward a little bit. You know, I was mystified by this and, and, and upset because, you know, whatever. I care about stuff like human rights and, um, or liberties. I was wondering what happened. And somebody sent me a note at one point on email, and it was a receipt. And it was the, uh, the head of Pfizer, or maybe it was Moderna. I mean, it doesn't matter. They're basically interchangeable at some level. Uh, it said, uh, oh, hey, to the head of uh, FDA, uh, hope you're doing well. It's nice to see you the other night. Hope your family's doing well. And, Look forward to seeing you at summer home later on. Um, P.S. I've just wired uh, $1.6 million to the FDA. And I read this and I thought, my God, this is a smoking gun. It can't, how is it that this, this astonishing document landed in, in my email? And so I was about to go to Twitter, as one does, and say, oh, look at this, a smoking gun, the whole system's corrupt. But before I did that, I thought I would check my sensibilities on this. I wrote a friend, I said, have you seen this thing? He goes, oh yeah, sure. That's the filing fee. Everybody pays it. What the hell? The filing fee? That's it? I mean, it's a clear bribe. It's the filing fee? I mean, I can't afford to pay that filing fee. What the hell? Well, that's the filing fee. How many of these filing fees does the FDA get? Oh, the filing fees constitute about 50% of the FDA's budget. When I heard this, I thought, oh yeah? Can you prove that? Uh, sure, uh, just go to the FDA website. What? Yeah, it's under the FAQ at the F FDA. Half of our budget comes from Big Pharma. So I'm looking at this thinking, so that's the situation, right? The corruption is so egregious, so massive, and so out in the open that nobody can understand it. Like, I'm not revealing anything to you. This is the system as it exists. So the system is that enormous filing fees that only the largest businesses could possibly ever uh, pay are supplemented by taxpayer dollars, which so taxpayers are paying these pharmaceutical companies to invent drugs. And then, uh, and then the government says, that's a good drug, stamp of approval. And by the way, here's your patent your patent for the drug so nobody else can, can, can do it. And what happens if people don't like your drug? Well, that's not a problem. We found out in 2021. They will make you take the medicine and penalize you with your job if you don't. So that's the system. I don't know. Is there another word besides corruption that we can use to describe this? 
I promise you, in the entire history of political philosophy, there's nobody who could ever defend such an openly fascistic, coercive, evil system as we have in this country. And it's not just a sidelight. It turns out that was the whole point all along. Did you know that? I certainly didn't know that. That was the whole point from the beginning. It was to reward these bastards. It turns out, as far as I can tell, at some point in history, our government went up for sale. And the pharmaceutical companies bought it. And the pharmaceutical companies enlisted the national security state to take away our liberty and to take away our civilian government. That's a short story. And I'm sorry for being such a bearer of bad news. I promise you, I could not have given this lecture last year or the year before or the year before. I've used this special time that Porkfest allocates me to tell you as much truth as I know. This is the truth as I know it. Now, as this, our time together moves on, I will get to what I believe are the answers, or not really. I mean, I don't believe that I know the answers, but I do want to elaborate a little bit more on this. That's the first part of the talk, what happened to us. There was a coup d'etat, that's it. It wasn't a public health mistake. They didn't get confused about the case fatality rate. They didn't accidentally approve a vaccine that they didn't know didn't work. It's all nonsense, it was all deliberate. And it happened to us in this country. Just like it almost, almost happened to Putin yesterday. You see this? I mean, the New York Times is celebrating this guy who tried to overthrow Putin yesterday, which I assume means that it was a CIA plot. I'm sorry I'm so cynical, but <laughs> that's where we are. And then I guess they made a deal this morning. They're like, hey, but how about you know, we pay you some money and you stop fighting? And he's like, okay, that's great. So, so, <laughs> so I think a lot of people in Washington are really upset today. Damn it, no war in Russia. What the hell? So that's what they did to us. Uh, we had a coup in this country against the civilian government. I worry these days about every sincere candidate who promises to destroy the administrative state. We just hosted Vivek Ramachami, and he said, we're going to tear it apart. We're going to level it. We're going to end the fourth branch of government. When I hear those words, I think, watch your back, buddy. Watch your back. It's getting serious. They're going to do everything they can to hold on to that power. I mean, everything. Spy on you, assassinate people, rig elections, everything and anything. There's no morality left. There's no limits left to the state. They will uh, do anything. So look at the people. We've got uh, Ron DeSantis out there saying the same thing. We at this conference had RFK the single most uh, dangerous enemy of the state alive. And he said those very words at this event. And you wonder why he was concerned about security? Yeah. He's got a reason to be concerned about his security. So this is serious. This is really serious. This is the moment. That you, you get it, right? This is the turning point. We're either going to be America you know, that we grew up in that our founders fought and died for, the, the, the land of the parchment with human rights that has inspired the whole world, the place that generated the Declaration of Independence that said, government is for the, cons it re relies fundamentally on the consent of the government. If we don't like it, we can get rid of it. That's a human right. That's what Thomas Jefferson said. Rights are inalienable. They can't be taken away for any reason, not even an infectious disease with a 99.97% survival rate, <laughs> okay? This is our country. Rights are ours. They're embedded in this land. That's who we are. On March 13th, they took it all away, and they want to keep it for themselves. This is the number one demand, and this is why they took over the media. This is why they took over big tech. This is why the pharmaceutical companies are enlisted, and guess what? The lockdown spread a tremendous amount of ill health in this country, tremendous amount. 
Why is it we're so vexed by things like RSV and funguses and suicide and you name it and autism? You, it go through the list. Every kind of ill health you could possibly ever imagine, they want to fix that too. And they've got a drug for you for that purpose also. That's the way the scam works. They make you sick. Uh, a quick story about something Brownstone has been doing. And, and again, Brownstone is in many ways on the front lines of this, and I never imagined that this would be true. Just to, just to give you a sense of the way this whole thing works. So there's this guy named David Gortler, who was a quiet and unassuming professor of pharmacology at Yale University, and doing quite well in his career, a conventional academic. When Trump came to power, he was tapped to come to the FDA, and he said, okay. He ascended up to, the th to, the, to being the third most powerful person at the FDA, and he started bothering the wrong people by asking the wrong questions. And when Trump left office, he left office too because he was a political appointee and decided to go back in academia, except that no one would hire him. You get it, right? He worked for the Trump administration, and the pharmace, pharma, uh, ph pharmacy schools in this country are completely owned by guess whom? The pharmaceutical companies, and he was dead. So he had to move home with his, uh, his mother in, uh, sound familiar? In, um, in, uh, in Arizona. And finally, uh, uh, at some point, called me and said, uh, can you help? And the reason for Brownstone's existence is to help people like this, and there are many. And I don't often tell their stories because they have privacy rights and I want to respect them, but we're helping many such people thanks to our very generous donors. Anyway, I said, well, David, at some point, if you ever want to write an article for us, please do. And so he's like, well, I don't know. You know but, oh, you know, but three years were driving me crazy. The Federal Reserve is considering, the Federal Reserve, same thing. The uh, FDA is considering approving an over-the-counter birth control pill for young women with no age limits. As far as I can tell, if they approve it, it's going to be available on every vending machine in America. I'm telling you, this stuff will make you infertile. It's dangerous. It's a death pill for young women. It's the worst thing I've ever seen. It should never have been approved, and yet here we are. Somebody's got a bull of the whistle on it. Now, speaking as a libertarian, my normal attitude would be, Take whatever pills you want, right? I mean, I want to. I want to legalize meth. I mean, what do I care? You know, free country. But the FDA is different, right? The FDA says that everything that they approve is safe and effective. So they disable the consumer mind and encourage people to take their drugs, right? So you've got a, like a, a stamp of approval. So that's not that's not liberty. That's fraud. And he wrote an article about this for, for, for Brownstone. When I pushed a publish on that, I thought, well, I'm worried about this because I don't know what the effects of this are going to be. I don't know anything about this drug, but I respect this ac academic. And not that many people read it, maybe two or 3,000. Well, six days later, I received some hysterical, threatening emails from guess whom? Our new government, which is the fact checkers. So that's the way it works, right? So you've got government who wants to censor you. And so they first worked through uh, social media companies, and they did that for a while. They said, well, it's kind of fun. We're censoring everybody. It's enjoyable. But, you know, it seems like people are starting to catch on. We don't want this job anymore. And, they, and then so they outsourced it to a third party called fact checkers, which the government also funds. And so now social media companies outsource their censorship to the fact checkers, which are basically working for the FDA and the pharma, in turn the pharmaceutical companies. So the fact checking organizations are writing me constantly going, how dare you publish this article? This is not correct. How come you didn't look at this study or look at that study? We want an immediate answer or we're going to kill you and you're going to be deprecated in all the search, search engines and, and uh, you'll be discredited forever. Of course, I did what one does with uh, such emails. I instantly deleted them, right? But then I thought, well, maybe David would be interested in these emails. So I dug them out of my delete box and sent them to him. And he was, you know, wrote me back and said, these emails are just complete bullshit. It's industry propaganda. Plus, how do a bunch of fact checkers, you know, with undergraduate degrees in sociology from the University of Pennsylvania, know anything about this over-the-counter birth control pill? I mean, this is just clearly something put out by industry itself. You see how it works, right? So I'm suddenly on the, on the front lines of this nonsense. Hardly anybody read this article, but you know who read it? 
the wrong people or the right people, however you want to put it. The industry cares very, very much about this. And so they're coming after us for having done this. This is how dangerous the situation has gotten in this country. God, I could tell you so many stories. Anyway, um, I wrote an article called 20 Terrible Realities Unearthed by Lockdowns. Our world has fundamentally changed. I mean, all of us to some extent are broken spiritually and otherwise. And I'm just gonna march through this really quick, and it sounds like 20, I can't stand the speech anymore, but it'll be quick. Surveillance and censorship by tech, big tech, that's my number one. This one's, I'm particularly bitter about this because I was celebrating big tech for many years. Oh, no more censorship thanks to big tech. Well, it turns out, basically big tech has been nationalized and they're censoring this entirely. Um, remarkable thing happened when, when Elon Musk, because the establishment, the ruling class can't get everything right. Elon Musk turns out to have, you know, have some respect for free speech in the First Amendment. He bought Twitter and he's given us free speech rights. So it's the one platform in America that's not fully controlled. What's most worrying to me about this big tech censorship, we have a number of lawsuits extant right now and we're winning them. And that's good, Missouri versus Biden among many others. We've got um, tens of thousands of pages of discovery showing that government worked very directly with, with, with big tech to censor uh, uh, everybody in contra contra contrast to the, to the First Amendment. And all the judges so far have said, yeah, I mean, we're, this is not Orwell. What are we doing here? This is not right. The, all these cases will probably land on the Supreme Court. So they're losing. But here's what troubles me the most about this situation. Even as these lawsuits are extant, and even as the discovery is coming out, and even as we're pumping out endless articles revealing the truth about this, and even though every forecast says they're going to lose, the government's going to lose these lawsuits, they're still doing it. And you know why? Because there's no real penalty. What are they gonna do? Charge the federal government? You know, send us a check? Compensate their lawyer's fees? You know, what, what's the mechanism by which we stop this? This is my concern. Let's say the Supreme Court says you've got to stop doing this shit. Who's going to enforce this? That's how bad the coup is. It's not clear to me, it's not obvious to me that the administrative state cares in the slightest bit what the courts say. I mean, let's think back at that court decision over masks. You remember the mask situation? CDC said, everybody has to wear masks. What, do you have that power? Oh, sure. Just look back at the 1944 Public Health Services Act. It says that the federal government's in charge of sanitation. Sanitation? I think of sanitation as being like taking out the trash. Well, you're kind of the trash, you know? So that was their justification. The court said, this is gibberish. These people are, are nonsense. The CDC appealed. You know what the basis of the appeal was? This is incredible. You don't judge us. You can't tell us what to do. We're in charge, not you. You want to take away our power? Screw you. That was their response. It's still being litigated today. The CDC is still insisting on the power to make you dress a certain way. That's how deep the deep state coup goes. I've already talked about number two, which is the power and influence of big pharma. I honestly didn't know that much about this subject four or five years ago. I, like most Americans, assumed that there was these great free enterprise companies out there. <coughs> They're making great drugs for us. I never imagined. We've gone through decades and decades and decades in which they've been poisoning in us, and we didn't know it. But that's the bottom line. Not to mention that, but as I mentioned earlier, they've been, they bought the government and they control it. We've got to stop them. This is the most important thing I can ever imagine. When, uh, <coughs> when Robert F. Kennedy talks about the need to uh, focus on restoring public health in this country, everybody knows what he really means. He means take away the, the real power the real people running the show. Very, very dangerous. <coughs> Hold on. Okay, power of big pharma, they own everything.
Okay, government propaganda by big media. Now, this is a remarkable thing uh, to discover that our media, which we used to think was a free press, is entirely owned by uh, deep state actors, uh, especially the New York Times. They chose the New York Times to reveal the pandemic and whip up the population on February 27th, those for a reason. And just yesterday, the New York Times ran a big article called, This is the Golden Age of Medicine. Yeah, so, just so you know. Don't believe a word that they say, but I didn't know this. We need to recognize this. One of the amusing aspects of the last few years is that um, the Great Barrington Declaration, just to show you how naive I used to be, the Great Barrington Declaration was nothing other than an, an, an attempt to educate journalists. That's all it was. It wasn't supposed to be some big, you know, protest document or anything. It was bringing in epidemiologists to educate journalists. That was it. And uh, Martin Kuhldorf, who, uh, whose idea it was to put this together, asked me to bring in a bunch of journalists. So I naively wrote the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the, this, that, this thing at Vox and whatever and said, hey, I've got some really important um, academics here. I think you'd like to learn what they have to say. Maybe come, come and visit and we'll have a nice session and learn from each other. Not one answered me. Nobody answered me because they didn't want to know. And I was shocked. In fact, I had to pack that room full of just yeah, warm bodies wherever I could find them just to make it look a little bit full. And after the authors of the Great Branch and Declaration realized that uh, no journalists were there, they decided to make the declaration. That's how it all came to be. It was an attempt to educate the journalists. We didn't know at that time they were entirely bought off. The corruption of public health. Who would have imagined in a million years that the CDC and the NIH <clears throat> would be the operations agents for, the, for, the, for totalitarianism? I don't think I ever would have predicted that. It comes from the place you least expect it. Uh, the consolidation of industry during this period is particularly chilling to me because you remember that um, they declared essential and unessential employees, right? And you had to read a PDF to find out if, if you were essential or not. Well, it's the same thing with businesses, essential and unessential businesses. So um, big box stores were essential, small businesses were not. That was the rule. So it was a big, it was a big business racket. I didn't, I didn't know the big business was that powerful. I've always been a great defender of big business. I was wrong. We've learned that all came from an organization called CISA, Cyber Information Security Agency. They divided the whole workforce between essential and unessential and business between essential and unessential. And during that time, industry was massively consolidated. Now big business in this country is basically a, f a front for big government. The influence and power of the administrative state. I didn't know this, but we have four branches of government. Now we know it. The cowardice of the intellectuals, my God. Wasn't it something? Academia completely flaked on us, didn't they? There wasn't anybody to help us at all. It was completely flaked out. It's because they can't tell the truth. It's actually one of the terrifying features of uh, modern life that the most high-end intellectuals are afraid to tell the truth. The only place you're gonna hear that uh, for the truth are people like normal people, people with jobs that they can switch around and move around, but if you're a full professor at Yale University, once you fail from that, there's no future for you anywhere else. Okay, I'm not gonna go through all these things. We're almost at an hour. So I think I'm gonna open it up for, for questions at this point. Um, I'm sorry I've been so dreadful in my announcements. I do think there's hope, I really do, but it's going to take all of our efforts. It's going to take everything we have. We can get our freedoms back. I have to believe that. Free State Project, God bless you. Pork Fest, God bless you. And thank you for coming tonight. Thank you very much. So I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to open it up for questions. Nature calls me. If you want to hang around for a few minutes, I'll be right back. Is that okay? Okay.